So, uh, good afternoon and welcome back to the afternoon session of the conference. Um, we have actually two exciting papers today on uh, expectation formation. So, Lumenita will uh, present the first paper today. Um, I already took a sneak peek at the paper before coming and it's really interesting, so I hope you will all keep your focus. Um, the title is Adjustment Dynamics During a Strategic Estimation task and understood you did some experimenting there too. Yeah. So I would ask you to maybe take the stage. And uh, Luminita is from University of Maryland and the discussant is Martin Ellison from the University of Oxford. You don't see him on the stage, but he will come on the stage at the moment of the discussion. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you especially to Professor Ellison for agreeing to discuss this paper. This is joint work with Melwyn Kaw and Mike Woodford. And we're interested in and motivated by um, uh, the question of nominal inertia. Why is it that changes in nominal spending um, uh, are not neutral in the short run? And this is an issue, an ongoing issue that's at the heart of monetary economics. And it's perhaps one of the strongest, one of the clearest examples of the real world deviating from predictions of the rational expectations hypothesis. Um, at least in the short run, right? We have evidence that adjustment is gradual. It eventually reaches the rational expectations equilibrium, but in the meantime, um, it has implications, it has distortions, and it has implications for welfare and for policy. Um, so why is it that prices don't adjust flexibly when nominal spending increases? Uh, one possible resolution to this conundrum is to suppose that people do have um, rational expectations, price setters do have rational expectations, but they face some kind of impediment or cost to adjusting the, their prices in a continuous fashion. And this is going to generate slow adjustment, especially in the presence of strategic complementarities. If individual price setters care a lot about the prices of other uh, producers in the economy, then they will be slower to adjust if those producers adjust slowly as well. And that's going to amplify the degree of sluggishness beyond even the, the cost of adjustment per se, right? So this is a popular explanation in the monetary literature. Um, one challenge with it is that it's been difficult to measure these costs in practice to identify sizable menu costs, so-called, or costs of, of um, adjustment of prices. Um, so we're, we're proposing here to consider more seriously um, kind of this broad issue of why is it that expectations don't adjust sluggishly, um, and in particular focusing on strategic environments, like the price setting example. Why is it that expectations don't adjust flexibly when people have to take into account the beliefs of others, right, and the actions of others? So just to recap, what does the rational expectations hypothesis say? It says that um, people are forward-looking, and they think through the consequences of their own actions, but also of the actions of all the other people in the economy. They incorporate optimally all the information that is relevant for their decision. Um, and they don't have any systematic biases, right? You can't fool um, all the people all the time, right? And they have common knowledge of this common information. They believe, rightly so, that all other people uh, behave in the same way, right? So as a result, subjective distributions um, uh, of uh, over um, outcomes coincide with the objective distributions, right? So an alternative hypothesis is that deviations from this rational expectations benchmark with all of these assumptions occur not because of adjustment costs, but maybe they occur because of some cognitive frictions that impede this reasoning process, right? So uh, maybe people economize on cognitive resources. And a particularly um, compelling source of evidence for these kinds of frictions is the lab. So control lab experiments are not particularly popular in macroeconomics or in monetary economics, so I'm here to try to convince you that they can be extremely useful, um, especially when we're thinking about deviations from rational expectations, right? So experiments, why, why are they so useful? Well, as an experimenter, you control the shocks, right? So you know how, in theory, people should respond. You also control the information that you give to the subjects, the participants, so you know, in theory, how they should be updating their beliefs based on this information. You also control the incentives that you provide to the participants to do the task well to the extent that they're incentivized by monetary payoffs, right? You can specify a monetary payoff function, right? Um, and 
And lastly, and perhaps most importantly in this context, is you can design an experiment that minimizes adjustment costs as much as possible. And then if you still see patterns of behavior that deviate from the rational expectations hypothesis um, in the same way that we see prices, say, deviate, in the field, then you, know, you might say, well, maybe it's not adjustment costs, right? And there have been several experiments specifically designed in a price setting environment that have argued that it really isn't about adjustment costs. Um, it really is about various types of cognitive frictions, right? So this goes back to the fair and tier on money illusion experiments, or more recently, Magnani, Gori, and Oprah uh, have an experiment on price setting where they um, uh, test SS adjustment models, right? Now, it might be that cognitive uh, limitations account for these deviations, but there's still the question of how they might um, generate um, deviations from the rational expectations equilibrium. And so to think about how cognitive frictions might impede adjustment, we can think about how people get to rational expectations to begin with. And the literature has considered two main ways through which people can converge to rational expectations equilibria, right? One way is kind of model-based inference. I know the structure of the economy, right? I know all the, uh, all the shocks and all the equations that characterize my model, and I can reason my way out of the paper bag, right? And I can infer what the equilibrium outcomes will be. Right? And the rational expectations equilibrium becomes a fixed point of this iterative kind of uh, inference process. Right? Another way to reach the rational expectations uh, is to say, maybe I don't know the structure of the economy, uh, but I can learn, I can use data and update my actions in real time um, based on my experience. And eventually, you know, if I learn enough, if I have a long enough series, uh, eventually I might converge to the rational expectations equilibrium. Notice that these two ways of reaching rational expectations are also the two ways in which the literature has tried to introduce deviations from rational expectations, right? So we can think about limits to inference, level K, reasoning, right? Maybe I stop the, the iterative inference process at some finite level before I converge to rational expectations or limits to the accumulation of data, right? So I can think about learning models, say constant gain learning model that has been super popular in the macro literature, and I can put limits on the accumulation of data and see you know, how, how people do in their um, adjustment to shocks, right? And now you might say, look, most of the time, it doesn't matter which process is getting me to the rational expectations equilibrium. In fact, the original rational expectations hypothesis is kind of behaviorally empty. Right? There's no explanation for how it is that people come to hold rational expectations. There's some process in the background. It doesn't matter. Here we are. We've reached uh, you know, the Garden of Eden, uh, and we're not leaving. Right? Um, and in many cases, it's true. It might not even matter how you got there. But there is a particular situation that is particularly relevant for monetary policy when it does matter. Um, and that is when you have structural changes or policy changes, regime changes, that trigger transitions to a new equilibrium. So for example, a central bank thinking about changing its inflation target or changing its communication policy uh, or changing its instrument is going to have to contemplate how the transition to the new equilibrium occurs. Is it going to be via model? Is it going to be people jump? on impact as the policy is announced. And maybe they don't jump too well. Maybe they don't jump high enough, but they still jump. Or is it going to be very gradual, slow, um, uh, adaptive kind of experience based? Right? These, these will affect the welfare implications. OK, so we want to understand, um, kind of, we want, we want to try to get at which of these two is more um, plausible. Maybe that's a big word. Um, but, um, but the issue with the existing literature is that these two modes of converging to rational expectations and of putting limits on rational expectations have been studied kind of separately, independently of each other, and in very different contexts. If you think contexts, if you think about the level K literature, it's really coming from the game theory, right? Literature from uh, experiments in the game theory literature. So here it's kind of one-shot games, right? Um, static games. Um, little opportunity to learn, right? So they're not really designed to think about dynamic macro type settings where the firm keeps setting its price over and over and over again. 
and is hit by shocks over and over again, right? On the flip side, if you think about the adaptive learning literature um, that's been applied in macro, it has been all about dynamics, right? But it has abstracted to a large extent from any strategic considerations in the learning process, right? So what we want to do is we want to kind of bring these two literatures together and we want to test them in the lab. So we propose an experiment in which we give subjects the opportunity to use either approach, right? Either model-based or learning-based. Um, each approach is going to be very useful for forecasting. You could do well with either one. Um, and we try not to prime them in any way, right? We try not to make one particularly more appealing than the other. And then we want to see how, the, how people respond to regime changes. Why regime changes? Because again, as I mentioned, these give very sharp predictions for what adjustment you should expect under the model-based um, mode of reasoning versus under the experiential learning-based mode of reasoning. Okay, so we're gonna look at these regime changes. Um, and what we're gonna do then, so this is the first kind of contribution, let's think about weird experiments where we let people choose how to think about the problem. Right, and here's a, here's a baby example of such an experiment. And then the second thing is let's think about how to do, how to present kind of a, a series of models that nest these two approaches to reasoning. Um, and let's get inspiration from the main macro frameworks that people have used to relax the full information rational expectations uh, hypothesis. So let's think about noisy forecasts, let's think about learning, let's think about inattentiveness in, to fundamentals, but let's put these in a framework in which strategic considerations are limited. If you think about, so many of you are familiar with the rational inattention literature, right? It's done within the context of rational expectations, right? So let's think about level K reasoning with these kinds of um, frictions. Okay, so you know, ideally what we're trying to do is kind of build a quote unquote toolkit for modeling bounded rationality in strategic settings where the strategic interaction is key. Okay, so here's the experiment, simple probability estimation task in which individual payoffs depend on an exogenous term, we'll call that the fundamental, and the group's uh, forecast, the average forecast in the group. So what do the people in this experiment have to do? They have to predict the percentage of green rings in a box that has an unknown mix of green and red rings, okay? They see ring draws coming out of the box. The percentage of green rings depends on ZT, the fundamental, plus alpha, which is the strategic complementarity parameter, times uh, uppercase P hat, that's the average of the group forecast, okay? Z, let's make the fundamental really simple, is just gonna take three values, low, mid, high, uniformly, it's drawn uniformly at the beginning of the experiment, and then after each draw, there's a tiny probability that Z will be um, that there will be a regime shift, that a new value of z will be drawn uniformly from either low, mid, high, okay? Uh, we tell all of this to the participants. So they have all the information they need to construct the model-based rational expectations forecast, which is given by this very simple uh, formula. It's the fundamental divided by one minus the degree of strategic complementarity. This implies, given these numbers, so you might ask why these numbers, so that we get really nice big gaps between the rational expectations forecasts, right? So you see it's uh, 0 0.17, 0 0.50, and 0 0.83, okay? So here's what the participant sees. This is the screen. On the right side, there's the box of rings. Rings appear out of this box at a regular interval. And your job as the participant is to try to predict the color of the next green ring, which is the same thing as trying to predict what the proportion of green rings is in the box, right? And your payoff is updated as a function of the deviation of your forecast from the realized state, ST. Okay, so you see the rings here. In the center of the box, you have the best response function, right? So you have this graph that plots what your optimal forecast should be as a function of the average forecast in the group. Here's the slope, the strategic complementarity slope, and we mark P0 and P1. We mark the um, extremes, right? So in principle, you could say, I think people in my group think that the probability of a green ring is 0.5. I can read off of that what my forecast should be optimally, right? I can use this best response function to read the model forecast. 
Here on the, on the left, yes, is the slider, which the subjects can move up and down. Um, they drag it up and down, and, and that's how they record their forecast with the slider, okay? And they have the payoff, okay? Here are the three possible states. So we've got low, mid, high. And whenever there's a shift in the fundamental, the best response function shifts up. So they have full information about the fundamental and the strategic strength, right? Uh, of interactions. So they could, and we can see if they, oopsie, sorry. We can see if they use this information to make their forecast, right? Um, okay, so how do they adjust? Well, under rational expectations, as soon as the fundamental shifts, the best response curve shifts, and everybody should immediately shift up in the first period, and then that's it, they should be done. In practice, uh, not everybody adjusts, so the cumulative fraction of adjusters starts at 28%. It's actually not much bigger after a shock than just unconditionally on average, right? So whether there's a shock or not, you know, about almost 30% of people adjust their forecast, right? And then as time passes, more and more of them adjust, right? Here I have a log scale so you can see the early dynamics, but you see that after 10 periods, I should mention, we asked them to forecast for 1,000 periods, okay? They're in the lab about half an hour, so it doesn't take forever. But, you know, after 10 out of 1,000 periods, right? So after 10, 80% um, of people have adjusted at least once. So observation number one, people don't adjust on impact. There's some delay. Observation number two, adjustment does occur pretty quickly. So if I were to fit a calvo to, to this uh, line of adjustment, I would get pretty rapid aggregate adjustment, right? If I were to compute the impulse response function. So let me do that. Let me do the impulse response function of the average forecast at some horizon t plus h in response to a change in the fundamental z at time t, right? Um, if 80% of people adjust after 10 periods, I should basically have almost full adjustment after, um, after 10 periods, nowhere near that, right? This is no longer log scale. Look at this impulse response function. It starts extremely low. It peaks at like 30 something percent, right? And then very gradually decays. This is even more sluggish than what we get in like macro series, right? This is extremely sluggish adjustment, right? So sluggish adjustment is not just due to infrequent adjustment, it's due to noisy, imperfect adjustment, right? And we're gonna wanna model that, okay? When they adjust, so conditional adjustment, what do they do? Do they go to the optimal? No, nowhere near the optimal, right? Here's the distribution of forecasts. Why do we care about adjustment um, forecasts conditional on adjusting? Because the standard assumption in macro models, in monetary models of price rigidity, is that firms don't adjust prices all the time, but that when they do adjust, they go to the P star, they go to the price that is maximizing the firm's continuation value, right? So this evidence is saying that actually these guys at least do not go to their P star at all. They go to a distribution that's not even centered on P star. So here's the mean in black, here's the rational expectations. There's systematic bias. Right? In the low state, their, systematic, their forecast is systematically too high. In the high state, their forecast is systematically too low. Okay? Dispersed biased uh, forecast conditional on adjustment. Okay? So now, um, with these facts, we want to think about how to model these guys. Right? So we can't do Calvo or menu cost. That's out the window. Right? So let's go back to our level K and learning type frameworks. So, Level K is kind of a natural starting point for this. We're, right, we're setting it up as your forecast, we're telling you, your forecast is the weighted average of a fundamental in what everybody else is doing. So let's start with level K, right? This is um, you know, huge literature in the experimental games uh, arena. Recently, it's come to the attention of macroeconomists as a way to kind of dampen the effect of general equilibrium forces and as a way to reduce kind of the strength of forward guidance um, in, in New Keynesian models, right? So um, what we don't have is really empirical guidance for macro applications. Again, we have level K estimates from these kind of one-shot static games. We don't really have estimates from dynamic uh, environments. So what we're gonna do is we're going to use a stochastic level K 
Uh, so we're going to implement basically a quantal response equilibrium where people stochastically uh, record forecasts and, so, and higher levels take into account the stochasticity of lower level forecasts. Okay, why are, you, why are you stochastic in your forecast? We're gonna assume that it, can, it takes effort for you to record the, the right forecast, right, the forecast that you want. If you don't exert effort, you're gonna end up with um, a random forecast from the uniform, because on the unit interval, because that's our range, that's our relevant range, right? Um, but you can exert effort Right? This effort has a control cost. Suppose this control cost is proportional to the entropy reduction of the distribution from which you draw. So how dispersed is your choice distribution from this uniform default? Right? And if you, if you do that, you're going to get that forecasts are drawn from a stochastic distribution that's parameterized by the effort cost. Okay? So for each subject, we're going to estimate what is their best fitting level of reasoning. Are they level zero, which is non-strategic? They just draw from the unit interval, but they know that the average is 0.5, so maybe they try to pick a more concentrated distribution around 0.5. Are they level one? Do they think everyone else is level zero stochastic, and do they themselves draw stochastic forecasts from a distribution centered on the level zero forecast? Are they level two? And so on. Okay. Okay, and so this is what we get. So we have level zero. We estimate about 11% of subjects. That is pretty high relative to the games literature. So typically in one-shot games, people estimate around 5 6%, maybe even less, of subjects being non-strategic, just kind of randomly you know, throwing their hands up in the air. Um, and then we have 32% level one, 25% level two. So this is, you know, kind of people in the games literature tend to estimate, you know, one and two as levels of reasoning, right? We have a surprising number of rational expectations or near rational expectations forecasters, right? A, a quarter of our data, you know, clearly took game theory in undergrad, according to this model. Um, okay, but we're kind of being a little unfair to level zero because you don't have to be strategic to do well on this task, right? You don't have to use the best response function. You could just track the rings, right? The proportion of green rings, remember, changes very slowly. There's a half a percent probability that it'll change on any given trial. So out of a thousand observations, on average, you have 200 trials to learn what this probability is, right? Um, so, even if they don't use the model-based approach, they could still do quite well by using learning, by tracking the patterns in the data, right? And not only are we being a little unfair to the level zero guys by forcing them to just be random, but we might actually overstate the degree of strategic sophistication because we might level, label as strategic people who are not actually strategic, but they're just tracking the rings pretty well. Okay, so let's, extend the definition of, or amend the definition of level zero to allow level zero guys to watch the data, to watch the ring realizations and learn from the rings to update their forecast. Um, and let's suppose they have a constant gain learning algorithm. So now we're gonna have a gain parameter that we have to estimate. Now, if you're a level one guy, you can think that level zero are non-strategic and naive. Right, so we can estimate that. Or you can think that level zero are constant gain learners, that they're ring watchers. So then what you have to do to best respond to those level zero is you yourself have to watch the rings. You have to form your own simulation of what you think the level zero guys are gonna forecast and then you best respond to that, okay? So let's estimate that for each level, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, for each subject, the best fitting level K the unit effort cost, this control cost that controls the degree of stochasticity in your forecast, lambda, and the gain parameter, which determines uh, the learning speed or determines how sensitive you are to the ring realizations. Okay, so now numbers change. So let's see, what do we have? Level zero, now we have half of our sample is level zero. So we went from 11% to 50% of our participants being labeled as non-strategic, learners, right, adaptive forecasters, right? So huge jump, and then we have, you know, a third level one, and we only have one guy that is like hanging in there, 
uh, at or near rational expectations, right? Um, and it, it, actually, I know the, who the subject is. It is a guy. And they did take game theory. <laughs> so I don't have the picture, but he's like, OK. Um, good. Um, so OK, so they, they watch the rings. And here I'm showing you that level 0, most of them, right, 47% are actually not random, right? So the naive level zero is not a really useful characterization of this, these data, right? There are a couple of guys, literally two, just two participants who are naive level zero, 27 participants who are watching the rings, and then the rest of the people are responding um, to the ring watchers, right? There was a couple of people who are level one and respond to the random naive guys. Um, OK, good. So we've improved the fit, right? So here I'm showing you the best fitting model. But um, uh, so you might say, um, OK, that's a lot of, um, uh, you know, that's a lot of level 0. That's a lot of level 1. But you know, I showed you how there's huge persistence in forecast. The impulse response function is incredibly sluggish, right? Um, and I kind of snuck it by you. But the way I estimated these numbers was by applying kind of the standard constant gain learning model. Forecast deterministic model forecast in period t is a weighted average between my prior forecast and uh, the new realization. Okay? And then I applied stochasticity to that. But we see that in the data, there's substantial serial correlation in forecast, so that's one. Uh, and moreover, I added this layer of stochasticity. I added these control costs, lambda. But they're really not doing anything. So far, all they're doing is adding noise, um, IID noise to the forecasts. right? They help me improve my fit, but they don't have any economic consequence. right? They don't have any implications for the model. So instead, let's consider an alternative in which I allow the errors in the level zero forecast to propagate. So instead of the model, the constant gain deterministic model of the level zero individual i at time t being a function of the prior constant gain forecast, as is done in the learning literature, right? So this bottom equation is the standard learning equation. Does that say I'm out of time? OK. Uh, let's do, I have just. Two minutes left. OK, sorry. Uh, <laughs> let's do the realized. Let's do forecast as a function of the realized forecast. So now stochasticity is going to be reflected in the constant gain uh, updated forecast. And so any errors that I make due to stochasticity are going to carry forward. And then what you get is that 91% are level 0. The only reason we were estimating strategic sophistication was because we weren't allowing level 0 to learn and because we weren't allowing serial correlation in the level 0 learning. Right? So even in a setting where deductive reasoning is simple and people have all the information they need to form the rational expectations forecast, people do a lot of statistical uh, learning. Okay, so let me end here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we have Martin Ellison from the University of Oxford who is going to give a discussion of the paper. OK, thank you very much for the organizers for, for inviting me here. It's very nice to be back in Frankfurt and see so many familiar faces. Thank you, Luminis, for an excellent presentation of the setting of this paper. I'm going to go straight into the meat. I'm going to go straight into the experiment and what I learnt about the experiment. And I'm going to do it by taking you back to an earlier experiment that this same set of co-authors did in 2017, which eventually came out in, in the JME. So these experiments are about trying to predict the probability that this ring that's going to appear on the screen is going to be green. That probability is largely constant, but occasionally moves around a bit. So the question is whether they can track reasonably well these changing probabilities, which are equated to some kind of structural break. 
So you get the screen on the left and you have a slider that you can move from left to right as these rings start to come out of the box. There's a green one has appeared just there. In this previous experiment, that probability was exogenous, but it was moving around very occasionally. On the right is what typically happens in this experiment, that the black line, which is the, the most blocky, is the actual change in the probability. Then the other lines are what a Bayesian updata would do, and the very jagged line is what a particular suspect would do. And you can see that these pretty much align well. So in that experiment, subjects were able to track quite well what had happened to these changes in probability. And quite rightly, Louis made, it, made a, a, a big point of this, of look, they, they change in discrete jumps too. So then you can think about pricing models and so on. OK, that was before. Now we've got a more sophisticated experiment, although it's kind of the same thing. You, you look on the left-hand side, you've now got a, a slider that goes up and down, and you're trying to predict the probability that the ring is going to be green. And now on the right-hand side, you've got the, the box of rings which these things pop out of, and it's a, it's a green one that's come out. But you, you can see there's a, there's a lot of stuff there in the middle which has already been explained what it all is. Um, but let's just leave it as there's a bunch of stuff in the middle at the moment that is, is, uh, is somehow, it's in front of you. You can't close it. If you, if, you, if you could cover it up, you might behave differently. But look on the right-hand side. What you get is that these beliefs are no longer tracking in the same way they did in the previous experiment. That is a lot more sluggish adjustment. This picture is slightly cheating because it's, it's an average rather than an individual, but the headline is that in this world where there's that thing in the middle, the adjustment is much slower. So the question is why? What's different? Well, as, as we've already learned, the big difference here is that that probability that a ring is going to be green has got an exogenous element, but has now got an endogenous element because it's going to depend on your own forecast of the probability and depend on the forecast that everybody else makes. We know this world, this is a forecasting the forecast of others type problem. So the probability PT, it's got this fundamental ZT and um, alpha times the average probability of everybody else. So I'm guessing if you set alpha equal to zero, we're back in that previous experiment. But there's all that stuff that's appearing in the middle. And that's what the design has, has communicated. They essentially tell you, tell the subjects what that Z is, what that exogenous product is. I guess that's implicit rather than explicit. Because what they do show explicitly is this best response function. So that's that thing there in the middle. So if you can only work out what you think everybody else thinks, you can then read off from the best response function what your estimate should be. I'm guessing you don't need to know the Z particularly at this time. But they are going to be telling you a lot of stuff, and they're going to also tell you when this Z is moving. So you, you will see that white line move up and down as the fundamentals change. Rational expectation equilibrium, we can work out what that is. And subjects have three seconds to make each response. There's a little timer there at the top. And I, I perfectly well understand why they do this, because in the previous experiment, you could, have a, you could move your slider and go, I'm ready, click, and the ring comes and it's either green or, or red, and then you can move your slider for a nice long time, trying to work out what to do, and click. But here, because it's going to depend on the forecasts of others, you've got to wait for the slowest person to come up with their estimate of the, of the probability. And so if you left an, un, an unlimited time, this would be an extremely slow experiment and people would get very angry. So the three seconds is because of that. 
what do they find? Nice to see there's some new results coming um, all the time. But the version that I read, there's 9% of subjects are, are pretty naive. They essentially say uh, probability is about a half. And they put a bit of noise on top of that. But they, they don't watch the rings. They just probably sit there, put 0.5, and they just watch their reward slowly ticking up and thinking, I'm making money here. I can, I can dream about what I'm going to cook tonight or for dinner and so on. 52% are not thinking at all about anybody else, but very nicely put, they're ring watchers. So they're doing like the people did in the previous experiment. And so they, they obviously see, oh, there's four green rings in a row. I'm going to jump up my probability that, there's, that it's green. So we've got 60% not doing anything strategic. There's then a set of agents who are identified as doing something a little bit strategic in that 23% think, well, I know there's all these naive people who are thinking about what they're going to cook for dinner tonight, and I'm going to take that into account. 16% think, ah, I know there's these ring watchers out there, and I'm going to take that into account. But even these people are pretty inattentive to that best response function and to that uh, estimate of the exogenous probability. So, inattention. So, here's, here's our wonderful authors looking very, very reliable and very, very bright. They have communicated a lot of information to these subjects, and they've drawn that picture. They've drawn the best response, and they've told them you go up to the best response, and so on. I, I trust them entirely. Um, but it's still an open question of how well they have communicated that particular strategy. So you can tell people that they can do this. And your comment that people who've done game theory understand this much better does make me think a little bit, there is, there, is there a communication element here that these are difficult to do? But even more so, there's a whole history of experiments where what you think is the experiment is not actually the experiment at all. So think of the, the famous invisible gorilla experiment where people were given a task and then this man in a gorilla suit ran around. And that was the whole experiment. So now when I, I, my, my students go and do experiments quite regularly, they come back and go, I think I've worked out what they really were after here. And so I'm, I'm a bit wondering whether there's some element of distrust in, in what's going on. In part because, I'm, I'm going to point at you, because you're the, but there, there's no way of knowing whether she's told the truth. The only way you can do that is to watch the green and the red rings. And that's going to be an imperfect measure of whether actually what I'm being told is, is correct. I'm stretching things a bit here and, and do that deliberately because... These are not the only people who we listen to, and we have to decide whether we trust them or not. There's this set of people um, who are talking a lot and explaining a lot of things about how the world works, and I'm not sure whether you want to work in a world where if they don't do like you are doing in their model, it's because they're somehow inattentive. You maybe just should have a terrible reputation. And so that's why they're all coming out. Okay, second point is it feels like these agents are a little bit under pressure. They have to three seconds to make a response. So imagine you're singing Hey Jude. Hey Jude is the longest Beatles record. You'd make 143 decisions before you get to the end of, of Hey Jude. I was going to sing and put a metronome for the decisions, but I thought I, I wouldn't make use of that too much. Now, when you look at the psychological literature, there's, of course, a lot of results about how people behave when they're under stress. So there was a paper in, in Nature last year, which was a, it was a bandit problem. You were, you were presented with four investment opportunities. 
So different risk return on these four things. And you, they were moving around, they were changing over time, and you had to pick the best one. If you put them under time pressure, the quality of their decisions got a lot worse. Another one which is rather fun is by, by Delaney. So, so they had a world where you could practice. So you could practice playing this game, and you could practice for as long as you wanted. And then the game would start. So you could see how much you want to teach yourself and how much you want to, to learn. And what they found is, if you stress people enough, they don't bother practicing. So one of the ways they stressed them is they made them do some IQ tests. And they were IQ tests that got harder and harder, so eventually you would fail. So everybody failed. And at that point, you're feeling pretty miserable about yourself. You think, I'm an idiot. I don't want to bother trying to learn how this investment game works. And then they, they performed a lot worse. The other one is they had, they had to sit with their feet in a very cold spa bath for a while. <laughs> and this brings up the blood pressure and makes you very stressed. We take, take them out of, the, out of the thing. And then they, make, they, they don't bother trying to learn, and they make bad decisions. So I, I'm, I'm coming back to that idea that if you're making a lot of decisions, how generalizable is that? Right, I have, I have two minutes um, to play the devil's advocate, um, which is a, a polite way of saying I'm going to say nasty things now and, and see how you react. So I look at this and I see subjects under time pressure in a complex strategic environment where they can't even verify that what they're being told is correct. Only uh, they, they can imperfectly tell. I'm not surprised that they are struggling a little bit to cope in that environment. And I don't know whether that's, I really want to bring that over to a world of strategic pricing or something. You are making these people do things in a complicated world and making them make very fast decisions. So how generalizable is that? Second, why care? So we already know that what, what we're after here is somehow we change our thinking of the way the economy behaves or agents behave in, in, in circumstances. So do the results from this lab experiment change our understanding of these macro-relevant decisions? And in part I say that because the previous paper did. <laughs> and it did give us more thought that you have these uh, discrete jumps. But we already have dynamic macro models with these level K agents. So Fari Verning, Yovino Sergeyev. Is it, if, I, if I've studied hard those papers, are you proposing that we would think about something a bit differently now? And maybe the answer to that is yes, but I, I didn't get a sense from the, the paper. And then finally, I, I throw in Hassan's work with which expectations matter. So I think there's quite a lot of interest in the learning expectations literature that, that which are the ones that we should really care about. Let's, let's think here. You, you said there was one guy who was bang on the rational expectations, who was taken game theory. So he's very rational, he probably moves very fast and, and updates quite quickly. Now, suppose that guy is doing that, but also then in the real world, he's super smart, so he goes and finds a hedge fund, and he becomes the marginal investor in the hedge fund. It could well be that I don't care that there's all these ring watchers and these things out there because um, there's some strategic sense of particular people. The experiment is very democratic in a way that everybody's expectations matter in exactly the same way. Whereas I think when we go to the economy, we don't think that's the case, that some people's expectations matter more than others. But thank you very much for giving me a chance to think about these things. I, I very much enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to the third one, presumably. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Martin.
and uh, great time management, by the way. We still have uh, five minutes. No, this is not for you anymore. Oh. That's for the, for the audience now. We have five minutes, apparently, for questions. So you're all a bit under stress now if you have to ask a question. <laughs> um, please go ahead. Um, and can you stand up and, and say who you are as well? So apparently there's also a virtual audience that uh, likes to know who's speaking. So. Uh, my name is Alp Simsek. From, I'm from Yale. And very nice paper. I really liked the results and the final conclusion. And um, I agree with you that in the real world, people face much, especially in macro, much more difficult uh, uh, strategic uh, problems. In fact, I'm not even sure if they understand the game, like in the agents in our model, if you teach MBAs or undergrads, realize that macro is very complex. For them, the strategic interactions are like a fuzzy thing. So I think Martin's description is very accurate. There's some fuzzy thing happens that determines uh, their incomes and you know they have no idea. So I, I very much think in the real world, people do a lot more strategic learning. But then the problem is that there's not that much opportunities with strategic learning. I've lived through two big recessions. They were not like each other. So I'm kind of wondering, what are the takeaways from your analysis? And this is just broad idea that people do strategic learning for macro modeling. I find it pretty alarming. It seems like our models should be very different. It should be like a lot more K0 type models. And where the zero could be actually very noisy, very different than kind of uh, rational expectations. Anyways. Thank you. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that's kind of what surprised us the most about these results, that people really are not strategic, even in what I would say is a simple environment relative to what people face, what firms and consumers face day to day. And I think it is pushing us kind of away from level K and more towards experience-based learning with noise. Um, and especially in situations of stress, it might very well be that people are actually much more likely to fall back on experience-based learning and it, that they find it harder to do higher level inference, right? Um, and even, let me, let me take this opportunity and then segue back to one of Martin's comments. I think um, even in situations when there is someone who is very sophisticated, right? So like the, the rational expectations guy, in situations where actions are strategic complements, the rational expectation guy would actually not do well. The, the most, you know, the highest performing agent would be the so-called worldly agent who understands that other people are boundedly rational and understands that other people are maybe using experience-based uh, forecasts. And so if you have boundedly rational people, the equilibrium outcome is going to be much closer to them in strategic complementarity cases than to the rational guy. If you have strategic substitutes, like the hedge fund example, then I completely agree. Um, the rational guy would, would tend to dominate the equilibrium. But I think, you know, kind of just to summarize, I think this is the takeaway that we probably want to move away from, uh, from so much strategic uh, thinking in our models. Just getting the room if there's any other. Um, one comment, if I may, sure. about telling the truth. So, okay, so very good point. Do these um, participants trust us or not to what they're telling us? We are required in economics to tell them the truth, and they know that. We cannot lie to them, and we cannot mislead them. So they know that what we're telling them is actually um, supposed to help them forecast better. And arguably, even if they don't really um, believe us, in principle, they could still be able to reason on their own and kind of figure out, figure out the best response function on their own, even if they don't use the figure and what we give them. And I think it's interesting that they just don't. They, they really shy away from that. Um, and it's interesting to contrast it to the previous experiment, because in this experiment, the rational uh, forecast actually changes discreetly, right? It stays fixed for long periods of time, and then it jumps, right? And here, and we see people making very noisy forecasts. Whereas in the previous, in the 2017 experiment, the base forecast was actually moving a lot, right? Um, so there's, there's kind of this key difference in, in the two experimental designs, and we see a lot of noise and a lot of sluggishness in both, whether the rational forecast moves a lot or um, discreetly. And, uh, and so Klaus Adam, if I'm not mistaken, discreetly raising his hand. So. <laughs> Yeah, Klaus Adam, University of Mannheim. So, so one aspect of strategic uncertainty, what made people push away from this strategic reasoning is that they don't know how others behave. 
And um, I, I think in this experiment, if I understood correctly, they don't observe the average forecast, right? So it's very difficult to know what others think in this environment just from seeing the realizations of the ring. You would have to make inference from the rings and their frequencies on what that might imply for the beliefs of the others, which is a very difficult task. So if you gave them the information about what others think, would you expect them to behave very differently or uh, see convergence uh, to a rational expectation outcome quicker or what's your guess? So good, good question, we might. So I'm not sure because we might, if we gave them information about what others think, we might be leading them towards using the model-based approach. Right? So I would hesitate to give them that, but it might be interesting to give it to them just to see what they do. In practice, firms don't really know what other firms are gonna do in terms of their pricing decisions. Um, so they kind of have to figure it out. And you know, Yuri uh, Gornichonko and Oli Koibion and uh, Satin Kumar have this uh, Do You Know That I Know paper where they ask firm managers about their own inflation expectations and then they ask them about what they think their competitors' inflation expectations are and it turns out you know, they're not very good at doing this higher level reasoning. So that makes me think that even in the real world people don't know what others are thinking. Let's go ahead. Laura Gatti, ECB. So, um, did you check in the uh, in the training rounds whether there's indication that they understood sort of the premise of the game, and did you check if they're colorblind? <laughs> Excellent question on both, on both counts. So we checked, it, we checked the color brown question after the 2017 experiment. It was kind of like, oops. Uh, so, so no problem on that. Um, we didn't explicitly ask them to describe what they think the task is about, but what we did do, and I didn't have a chance to mention, is we had a subset of the subjects return. And so we have these returning participants. They did it once, and then they went home and, you know, made dinner, and then a couple of days later they came back, and we were really curious to see if they would change their approach. You know, maybe they thought about it, and then, you know, uh, came back with a new approach, and they actually didn't. They did the same thing, um, which doesn't really answer did they understand the task, but it does suggest that the way they understood it was kind of stable. This is just a clarify. Hassan Afruzi from Columbia. I just have a clarifying question. Regarding the time pressure, did you try to actually like extend the time period to see what happens? Uh, that's the question. And then one suggestion to understand the mechanisms. Um, you could have a control group of these guys playing against the computer to get around uh, Klaus's yes. question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. And time. if you have done it, I'm really interested in knowing. <laughs> we haven't, but we are definitely planning to do that. There's an issue. Okay, so on the time pressure, because that's easy to answer. We tried five seconds, um, and it was kind of a bit too long. So then we shifted it to three seconds. Um, for what it's worth, in the 2017 experiment, they were clicking pretty fast. Uh, but yeah, that's a caveat. And on the playing against the computer, absolutely, we've been talking about doing that, also because it's cheaper. Uh, there's some IRB questions about what we're, what we're allowed to, t you know, how to, how to present that and if that's going to change their behavior if they think they're playing against a computer versus against other humans. So we're still trying to figure that out, but yeah. So thank you very much for this thank very you. nice paper, nice experiments, and I guess you'll be experimenting further in the future. So yes, very absolutely. Keen on seeing the Stay author. tuned. Yes. Thank you. So then I would ask the presenters and discussant for the next paper to come on the stage. So this paper also looks into how expectations are formed and at least, you know, what can explain that forecast errors are not uh, as unpredictable as the rational expectations they would, would hold. And the presenter is Ina Haidini. I hope you, I pronounce your name also correctly. She's from the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. And the paper is entitled Predictable Forecast Centers in Full Information Rational Expectations Models 
with regime shifts. That was a whole mouthful. Thank Please you. go ahead. Um, well, first, many thanks to the organizers for putting this paper um, in the program. I'm an economist at the Cleveland Fed, so the usual disclaimer that these are our own views applies. So today what I'm going to try to argue a little bit is that maybe the stance of our FIRE macro models is not as worrisome as we have been thinking. So we know that the hallmark of linear full information rational expectations or what is now known famously by the acronym of FIRE models is that exposed forecasting errors would be uncorrelated with any piece of information that's available at the time of forecast. However, contrary to this, uh, there's many studies on surveys on macroeconomic variables that have in fact shown that forecast errors can be systematically predictable. And what I'm showing in this slide here are two regressions that have um, become now under the spotlight in the recent literature. The first regression has been introduced by Colas, um, Alex Colas and his co-author in 2021, where they're essentially regressing exposed forecasting errors on realizations at the time of the forecast. And they're finding that that gamma estimate is, is negative, telling us a story about forecasters overreacting to current realizations. And the second regression is brought forward by Corbyn and Gorodnichenko in 2015, where they're regressing exposed forecasting errors on ex-ante forecasting revisions. They're finding a positive coefficient delta telling us a story about forecasters underreacting to new information at the time of forecast. And of course, this has been used as, as um, a great motivation to, um, uh, to, to write on informational frictions and or departures from rational expectations altogether. And of course, the expectations formation process has, has implications for the transmission of monetary policy or prescriptions that are coming out of, uh, optimal, out of optimal monetary policy. So therefore, getting an understanding of how people form expectations is, is particularly important. In the present paper, what we're going to do is, in a sense, take a step back, and we're going to study the behavior of forecast errors in models with regime shifts that are being solved under fire. And here, regime shifts, they can come in the form of changes in the economic environment, or they can come in the form of changes in the monetary or, or fiscal stance. And the core result of our paper is that the presence of regime shifts can actually change the landmark quite a bit. In particular, we're going to find that regime shifts imply exposed, predictable, regime-dependent uh, forecast errors. And there's two important implications coming out of our core result of the paper. The first one is that forecast error predictability now is not a sufficient condition anymore to reject fire. In particular, we're going to find that the presence of regime shifts is going to imply non-zero forecast error regression estimates. Moreover, overrolling, um, overrolling uh, window samples, we're going to find that the presence of regime shifts is going to give rise to what we call in the paper, these waves of forecasters over and under reacting to information at the time of forecast. And we're going to confirm this implication using uh, US data from the survey of professional forecasters. The second important implication, and maybe a bigger picture implication, is that regression estimates now alone, they might not be as informative about specific alternative expectations theories. Why is it the case? Well, it's going to be the case because forecasting errors are now complicated functions of the history of realized regimes. And moreover, those regression estimates are generally going to suffer from omitted variable bias that becomes more severe the more complicated the data generating process is. Okay, but we're not going to stop there. We're going to try to be a little bit more, more constructive. So we're going to offer a regime robust test of fire. The way that this is going to work uh, in a nutshell is that we're going to assume that the solution of a model with regime shifts under fire to be the null hypothesis. And then we're going to use that to simulate realizations of macro variables of interest as well as fire forecasts. And we're going to use those simulated data to construct the distribution of regression estimates all while incorporating uncertainty about the data generating process as well as the regime realizations. And from there, we're going to compute or assess whether the empirical estimates right, are inconsistent or not with, with fire. Okay. 
We're going finally to apply our regime robust test to a medium scale a DSG model with regime shifts in monetary policy. And we're going to find that the test fails to decisively reject fire. Um, however, the model is able to generate these um, sizable waves that we find in the data, but waves they look generally very different from what, uh, from what we see in the, in the SPF estimates. And we see this as being an empirical motivation to consider maybe other types, richer forms of, of regime shifts and or departures from full information. Okay, so let me get started. Uh, what I'm showing in this, in this table is that forecast error regression estimates are going to, of course, depend on the variable of interest, but more importantly, on the sample period. So panel A here is showing the estimates of, of gamma for output growth and inflation over uh, two different samples, a sample starting from 1970s and the other one starting from early 1980s. Focusing on inflation, what we're going to, to find is that that estimate is positive but highly insignificant over the full sample, but it turns uh, negative and highly significant so once we start the sample from the 1980s. In panel B, we're showing the results for the Koibin and Goretnichenko type of, of regression, which uh, turns out to be more robust than, than the former one. However, again, looking at, at inflation, for instance, we find that that coefficient terms from being very highly significant um, and significant um, uh, and positive to, um, to highly uh, insignificant. Now we're going to push this one step further and repeat the same regressions over 40 quarter rolling window um, samples. What we're showing here in the top two panels is the evolution of the gamma estimates for inflation and output growth, and in the bottom two panels, the delta estimates for those same variables. And what you see, right, is that there's times when those estimates are negative, and then there's other times when those estimates turn positive, right, giving rise to, to what we're calling waves of forecasters over and under reacting. But you cannot get this type of behavior in models where the data generating process right, is subject to fixed parameters. No matter what type of sophisticated information frictions you want to introduce to the model. So what I'm going to try now is convince you through the lenses of a very simple univariate model with Markov regime shifts that the presence of regimes can actually uh, give rise to, to these waves. So the setting is super simple. Um, equation number one, uh, think of it as, as an observation equation. There's some observable y that depends on an endogenous variable x. The endogenous variable x itself follows an error one process. Now the dependence of y on x is subject to regime shifts. Right? So a is switching in between two different values with some exogenous transition probabilities. Now what does the forecaster know in our setting? The forecaster is endowed with fire, so they know one and two, right? They know the data generating process, they know the different values of A, they know the switching probabilities or this transition matrix P. What they do not know is the regimes that will get realized in the future as much as they do not know the innovations, right? The exact values of the innovations that will get realized in the future. So what are they going to do is using these uh, population, if you wish, transition probabilities, they're going to form expectations by taking a weighted average between the two different data generating processes, right? Accounting for both A1 and, and A2. But exposed, only one of those regimes will get realized, and that's going to be at the core of why regime shifts will introduce in finite samples um, uh, predictability. Okay, in the paper then, we're going to show that the age period ahead forecasting errors can be written in the following form. There's a predictability part, right, the first term, and then there's the usual unpredictable part that's just IID noise, okay? Now, effectively, if I were to shut down regime shifts, what I'll be setting is A1 equal to A2. So therefore, that first component drops out and we're back to square one, right? But if I were to assume without loss of generality that regime one is a more volatile regime, what is going to happen is that that gamma is going to become positive if exposed, the more volatile regime gets realized, but negative if exposed, the least volatile regime uh, gets realized. Okay, but now suppose that, that you're the econometrician. I simulate data, right, using this, this model over a finite sample of, um, of size capital T, um, right, of course, given conditional on, on a regime sequence, 
And I'm going to ask you to estimate this, uh, this regression right there, right? So you're interested in pinning down the gamma, but you don't really know, right, how this data has been, has been generated. We show in the paper that the expected regression coefficient implied by this univariate model is given by this convoluted expression. And here we're controlling for um, a finite sample bias coming from the fact that um, in a time series context, that y is not orthogonal to, um, to the error term. But what is uh, particularly important here is that the expected regression coefficient, right, gamma, is generally different from zero. And it's going to depend in particular on these little f's, which are nothing more but the analog of the transition probabilities in finite sample. Right? And it's this discrepancy between the probability um, of regime realizations in the population versus the finite sample that is going to, to introduce uh, these non-zero uh, gamma estimates in finite samples, right? So generally, the G function, right, that, that function that I'm, uh, it's again a convoluted function, is going to be generally different from zero. There's going to be times when it will be positive, other times when it will be negative, giving rise to these waves. But if I go to asymptotics or set this capital T to be extremely large, I'll eventually uh, converge to the implications of fire that we typically use. So the takeaways from, um, from what I talked thus far are that first, forecast error predictability might not be a sufficient condition to reject fire. Across rolling window samples, regime shifts produce waves of forecasters over and under reacting. And forecast error regressions by themselves do not have structural interpretation, right? So that gamma becomes a super complex function in this super simple univariate model of, of regime realizations. Moving on, however, into more maybe realistic data generating processes, um, the problems become a little bit more severe. What I'm showing here in these two equations is essentially the state space representation of the solution of your favorite, um, of your favorite DSG model with, with regime shifts, okay? And the we show in the paper that the implication for the forecast errors of any variable Y that is part of the vector of observables capital Y um, are the following. First, reduced form regression coefficients would be complicated functions now of the entire sequence of regime realizations. And second, um, and maybe um, very important, these reduced form regressions would be subject to omitted variable bias that again becomes more severe with the complexity of the data generating process. Why is that the case? Well, that is the case because the regressors, the little y, and the ex ante forecasting revisions about little y, right, they do not span the full information set that is being used by the agent to form forecasts. Right? Um, moving on to what we propose as a regime robust test of fire. So I'll, I'll try to give a little bit more, more details on, the, on this slide, but happy to, to answer questions afterwards. Uh, so the way that this is going to work is. You take, again, your favorite model uh, with regime shifts. You solve it under the assumption of fire, and we're going to use that as a null hypothesis. Okay? Um, to introduce uncertainty about the data generating process, we're going to estimate the posterior distribution of the parameters guiding the data generating process. And by accounting, right, by taking into account the posterior distribution of the parameters in the data generating process, in a sense, we're introducing uncertainty about the data generating process itself. Out of this distribution, we're going to draw n parameter vectors. And for each parameter vector, we're going to simulate case samples of finite sample, um, finite uh, size t. And from there, we're going to estimate our uh, gamma and delta, if you wish. Again, under these would be simulations under the fire hypothesis. And from there, we're going to compute the probability that these simulated um, estimates are, their absolute value is higher than the absolute value of the empirical estimate. And that's going to serve for us as a t-test of the null. Right, so in a sense, we're going to build the distribution of the null hypothesis from scratch. Now, this is similar in spirit to, to other papers, um, Andolfato and, and others, Jamie, paper 2008, as well as um, Klaus Adam and his co-authors 2017, with the difference that our test is going to be applied to a fire model 
or fire models generally, generally with regime shifts. And we're also going to account for uncertainty about both the data generating process and regime realizations. And here maybe an important remark is that this regime robust test, while we applied to the fire hypothesis, it can be in principle applied to any expectations uh, theory of your liking. Okay. Um, this figure um, is going to show the visual, the visualization, or it's visualizing the results of the regime robust um, test of fire for the univariate model applied to output growth data. So let me guide you through, through the figure. The vertical black line is showing the empirical estimate of gamma, and the gray curve is showing the empirical null hypothesis of fire. Think of that as being the null hypothesis with no regime shifts, or differently, the null hypothesis that the literature has been using uh, you know, to test uh, for fire. On the other hand, in red, we're showing the vertical line to be the mean gamma coming out of our simulation procedure. And the distribution in red is showing the distribution of those gammas. Okay? Now, if you were an econometrician that believed in a world with no regime shifts, what you do you know, to test whether this gamma is consistent with fire or not, you'd essentially compute um, you'd essentially compute this area in gray here, which would be the one-sided uh, test. Multiply that by, by two, and you're going to get you're going to get the p-value. If that you know p-value is sufficiently low, then you can say, well, gamma is not consistent with with fire. But things change dramatically, right? Once we take into account the red distribution, which is the fire consistent distribution of the gamma estimates in a world with regime shifts. And you can see here that that area becomes much larger than what we saw earlier shaded in gray. Okay, so from here, if you're an econometrician right, that wants to use as, as a null hypothesis a fire model with regime shifts, you're going to be inclined to say that, well, this gamma is not really inconsistent with, with fire. Applying this then to, uh, to a larger model, let me give you a little bit of a description of, of the model. Um, so the model that we're going to use is, is um, um, very similar to, uh, to Cristiano and others, Metz and Wouters, Justiniano and, and others. So it has all of the bells and, and whistles of, of those models with the difference that we're going to think of a monetary pol policy rule that's subject to exogenous regime shifts similar to Bianchi 2013 paper. Right, so now the, the, the monetary policy is responding to output growth as well as inflation in deviations from, from the target with some smoothness, but all of those parameters are, are subject to, uh, to exogenous Markov uh, switches. We're going to estimate this model using post-war uh, US macro data and then Right. Given our data generating process now, what we're going to do is run our regime robust uh, fire test using, uh, using uh, 10,000 draws from the posterior distribution of the parameters and then simulating for each of those posterior draws our model uh, 200 times. Okay. And this is what we're going to get. So in panel A, we're showing the uh, gamma estimates um, I'm sorry, we're, we're, we're showing the results of the regime robust fire test for, um, for the gamma estimates for both output growth and inflation across the full sample starting from the 1970s as well as the sub-sample starting from the early 1980s. And in all of the cases, right, focusing on the red and the, and the blue um, values there, the probability right, that, 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 that those gammas are consistent with fire is actually way above the 10% threshold. Moving on then with panel B, right, where we're running the Koivinen Gortnichenko type of a regression, um, over the full sample, the probability that these are consistent with fire is actually zero. But starting from the 1980s, um, it's only for, for inflation that, that we can say that maybe the estimate of delta is not that inconsistent with, with the fire hypothesis. What we can do next is repeat this regime robust um, fire test across the 40 quarter rolling window samples. So what I'm showing here 
In blue are the SPF estimates that we, that we saw in, in the initial slides. And in red, we're plotting or we're shading the 90% uh, coverage bands that are implied by, by the model itself. And as you can see, most of the times, right, the, the blue estimates are falling, they're falling within the bands. Um, but also, what we can see from this figure is that switches in monetary policy themselves, they might not be all that responsible right, for, for these waves. Why is that the case? Well, because the coverage bands, they're not you know, moving much. They're actually almost not moving at all over time. Corroborating this furthermore, what we're going to do is plot the, um, the mean estimates of gamma and delta conditional on macro data. And we're, we're, we're plotting that, that in red. And what we see is that, of course, we're getting sizable waves conditional on macro data that can move with the SPF waves, but they're not all the same. Right? So there's differences between what we see in the SPF data versus what is implied by our, by our model conditional on, on macroeconomic observables. So taking stock from, um, from this application, what can we say? Uh, well, we can say that first, regime robust, this re regime robust test of fire um, fails to decisively reject the hypothesis of fire. Um, our, the DSG model that we considered, right, with regime shifts in, in monetary policy, gives rise to sizable waves of over and under reaction. However, it seems that the regimes in monetary policy themselves, they play a small role for, for these waves. But the model implied uh, waves, right, they're, they're sizable, however, they're somewhat different from what we see in the, in the SPF. We do see this not as bad news, but we do see it as an empirical motivation to assess the extent to which alternative data generating processes that are maybe accounting for more realistic or richer, um, richer types of, of regime shifts and maybe potential departures from, uh, from fire can generate the type of waves that we are observing in the, in the SPF data. And finally, to conclude in the next two minutes that I have left, um, what we're trying to show through this paper um, is that eventually the data generating process, that, that the, the underlying data generating process that we consider matters a lot for how we test for expectations. And in particular, Fire models with regime shifts, they can imply predictable regime dependent forecasting errors, give rise to these waves of over and under reaction. And therefore, expectation theories, they need to be evaluated as part of fully specified structural models that, of course, incorporate plausible regime shifts. Otherwise, we cannot be consistent with these waves that we're observing in the SPF data. And we are proposing in the paper a regime robust test that we apply to FIRE, but can likewise be applied to any expectations theory of your liking. And finally, the application with a medium scale DSG model with regime shifts in monetary policy showed that we cannot decisively reject a FIRE, but that um, maybe the, the, the regimes that, that we're considering are not fully consistent with what, or, or are not the, the right ones that would give rise to the SPF waves that we're observing in the data. So therefore, just to reiterate, we see that as an empirical motivation to consider richer regime shifts and or uh, departures from uh, full information. So that sort of remains an open question for, um, for the literature. Thank you, and I look forward to Alex's discussion. Thank you very much. And so Alex Kohlhaas will be discussing the paper, and he's also from the University of Oxford. OK, yeah, so thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this very uh, thoughtful and thought-provoking paper by Ina and Andre on uh, predictable errors in fire models with regime shifts. So uh, the motivation is as follows. The past decade has seen a resurgence of interest in non-full information rational expectation models of expectations. The FIRE model entails fast error-free responses of all prices and all quantities and of all agents to all kinds of information. And this contrasts quite strongly with the often sluggish heterogeneous responses that we see in both macro and survey data. To discriminate between different candidate models, the literature is so far to some extent focused on differences in the predictability of forecast errors in particular, the correlation of forecast errors between various variables and the patterns that this can create. 
This in turn leads to this basic question of whether the predictability of forecast errors can really help reject fire. And in particular, the question that Ina and Andre look at is whether models of regime shift can help generate some of the predictability that we see in the data. And what the paper shows is that it indeed can be the case. It studies a simple model of regime change and shows that this model can help account for some of the predictability that we see in survey errors. At a, at a broad level, going back to the work of Goodwin and Muth, uh, we've known that survey errors have been predictable for a quite long time. In fact, this is why Muth introduced imperfect information in his formulation of rational expectations. We've also known that there have been two potential explanations for this. There have been rational explanations and there have been behavioral explanations. On the rational side, Varian showed in the 70s that if agents have non-quadratic preferences, for instance, if professional forecasters care about what forecasts other professional forecasters make, this is naturally going to lead to some predictability in the forecast errors that they, that they create. Similarly, we know that if the agent and the econometrician basically consider different worlds, different economies, we're going to generate some predictability of the forecast errors just by the mismatch from an agent to an econometrician. On the other hand, behavioral models uh, have considered a, a whole range of different behavioral frictions from extrapolation to limited memory to inattention and so forth, and documented how these behavioral drivers can also help generate some of the predictability of survey errors that what we see. Now what Ina and Andre do is they look at a kind of a particular the subset of this agent econometrician distinction, they look at regime shifts which the econometrician does not take into account when running their regressions. And they show that this can lead to predictability in forecast errors which can help account for some of these expectational puzzles. The paper basically has three parts. The first part is to provide some motivating evidence. It looks at one year ahead forecast from the SPF of output and inflation. It looks at the overall sample of expectation errors. And what I've plotted here on this slide here is I've just taken this, and these are common regressions to run, they've just uh, taken this from a different paper that also includes your area data. Now what we see is that current realizations of output inflation help predict uh, the output error with a negative coefficient. So when, expectation, uh, when output is high, expectations are too high. And conversely, there is a positive correlation between individual forecast errors and the average forecast re revision, reflecting somehow that agents do not fully respond to the average information that's been received between two periods. Okay. But the takeaway from these kinds of pictures is that current-ish information helps predict individual errors. Now, when you look, though, at the time variation of these plots, you see that there is substantial time variation. Okay, so on the left-hand side here, I've just plotted the figure uh, for this coefficient gamma, the correlation between individual forecast errors and output growth. And you see that there is substantial time variation in the coefficients. The second part of this paper then tries to explain this time variation uh, as a result of a regime shift. Okay? And this was kind of the simplest example that I could come up with. Right? So in this model, there's just an agent, and this agent just tries to predict what output is going to be tomorrow based on some signal x. Okay? Now this signal can either be good, so the correlation between output and the signal can be high. The rho can be equal to rho h here with some probability p, or it can be low with some other probability p, uh, 1 minus p. Okay? Now the agent's expectation, the agent's conditional expectation here, is just going to equal some linear combination of the two cases. So if the signal is good, so rho is equal to rho h, or and if the signal is bad, if rho is equal to rho l. Now you can very uh, easily compute what the agent's forecast error is. And you can see from this slide here that the forecast error is basically comprised of two components. It's comprised of the standard forecast error, eta t plus one, the kind of unpredictable part of, uh, of output. And then it's made up of the signal itself. There's some coefficient on the signal itself, which I've just called beta. And you can go a bit further, you can say that if the signal is bad, so if rho is equal to rho L, then this coefficient beta is going to be negative, and conversely, if we're in the high state, the, then uh, beta is going to be positive, and this economy cycles through high and low states, this coefficient beta is going to return from positive to negative to positive to negative. Okay. Basically, what's happening here is that the agent and the econometrician are entertaining different realities. Okay. So the agent knows that there are structural breaks, and behaves accordingly, whereas the econometrician runs a regression which does not entail or allow for any kind of uh, structural breaks. The paper then tries to finally to be more constructive and create a regime shift robust test. It uses a DSGRS model, kind of smets and valses with regime shifts um, that are estimated and parameterized to match standard data. And they use that then as a DGP for a regime shift robust test of full information rational expectations. 
basically use this model as a data generating process to see whether we can generate from regime shifts this kind of error predictability that we see on average and whether we can generate sizable waves in the error predictability just from regime shifts alone. And what the paper shows is you know, we can generate these sizable waves and we, but we cannot really reject fire. Okay? So this is my takeaway, at least from this picture here. The red line and the blue lines don't really coincide so well, but the band is like red all over. Right? So we cannot really reject full information, rational expectations from this model with regime shifts. Overall, this paper is very clear and transparent in results. It also studies an ex-ante plausible source of predictability of errors, in my view. At the same time, I also think it's about slightly more than just regime shifts. It's what are like some of the underlying drivers of the inherent behavioral rules like extrapolation that we all follow. Um, now I have uh, three comments. The first is that it, it is really very hard to detect regime shifts in the data. Okay? So here I've written down the simplest model I could think about for output. Okay? So output here is just some linear function of productivity and productivity follows a simple error one. We're going to parameterize this model in a very simple way. So we're going to set beta, the standard deviation of shocks, all equal to 1. We're going to say there's going to be 2% output growth from one quarter to the next annualized on average. And we're going to set the serial correlation of productivity equal to 0.80. And then we're going to run rolling regressions with a window size equal to 20. And we're going to look at how the estimate of beta that we're going to get from these rolling regressions are going to look. And if we do that, we get this kind of following picture here. Okay? So in red is the true coefficient 1. In orange is the coefficient you would get if you would run the full sample. It's like 0.98. And then you get these like 20 window rolling regression coefficients. And what we can see is that there are some waves. And if I told you that there was a structural break in round period 60, you would have a kind of a hard time telling me that was not the case, even though there is no structural break. So the point here is just that. In the data, it's very hard to detect structural breaks. Regimes, the, the statistical tests we have, have extremely low power. And this brings like a conceptual issue of explanations that are hard to kind of measure in the data. Okay? So how should we get a better handle on measuring what regime changes actually happen? And hence, how can they help predict, uh, how can they help explain the predictability of forecast errors that we see? My second point is about the, the totality of evidence. Okay? So the presence of some sort of information friction, or so imperfect information, has a comprehensive and what I would like to call varied evidence. Right? We have direct evidence. We have survey evidence. We have laboratory evidence, as we've just seen, for some sort of noisy cognition. And we have also some macro evidence. And all of this totality aligns with the existence of some types of information frictions. Okay? So on the slide here, I've just plotted one uh, kind of direct evidence. This is a slide from a very uh, famous paper by Mankiw and Wolfers. And it shows in December 2003, there was a subset of, of the Michigan survey of consumers that were asked about what was inflation in 2003. Okay? So at the end of the year, they were asked, they were explained what is aggregate inflation, and they provide a very wide range of answers. Right? Kind of consistent with the notion that agents simply do not know, have some imperfect information about what is the aggregate inflation rate. By contrast, as we've seen, it's kind of hard to establish very well-founded evidence for what kind of regime shifts have happened. Okay? Perhaps we can look at some in economic policy, but if we want to look at production technologies or other kind of I issues in macro, it becomes harder because the question about how many regime shifts have happened, what parameters do regime shifts happen to, how frequently, are questions that we have a hard time answering. Okay? But I think this also offers one like, avenue forward for this paper. I think one can use these waves that are measured in the data to help discipline what kind of regime shifts are possible to have. Okay? So what structural breaks have occurred to what parameters, and perhaps we can use these uh, waves of over and under reactions to help quantify and discipline the regime shifts that must have happened in order to yield these regression coefficients. Okay? Perhaps we can reverse engineer what kind of regime shifts should look like in order to explain the data, and then we can contrast it perhaps with historical record to see if that could align with what we see. Then finally, the literature on, uh, that has used survey evidence, the predictability of survey errors, went quite quickly from studying average expectations to looking at individual expectations. Okay? There were statistical reasons to do so, but it's also because the differences that we got in results from running at them at the average level to the individual level was informative about which models of expectation formation which could be consistent with the data. Okay? These kinds of differences between results at the average level and at the individual level cannot occur under full information and rational expectations where everyone has the same beliefs. 
Alongside this, there was a literature which documented systematic heterogeneity in expectations. So we've seen how the way people form expectations is different along the wealth dimension, income dimension, and IQ dimension. And again, these differences cannot be accounted for by models in which full information and rational expectations are assumed, because in all of these models, agents have the same beliefs. They have homogeneous expectations. So the question I would like, kind of like to ask is how should we think about models in which agents actually entertain different possibilities of regime shifts? How do we generate models where there are actually heterogeneous beliefs about the future? So finally, to conclude, um, the past decade has seen considerable attention devoted to the predictability of survey errors and in the implications for different models of expectation formation. And Ina and Andre compellingly show that regime shifts can be added to the list of potential explanations that we have for these data moments. Okay? So we can have regime shifts in attention, memory, strategic incentives, overconfidence. This is just some of the ones that have been proposed in the literature to explain the predictability of survey errors that we see. But I see that as, as we as macroeconomists, what I feel we're missing is some notion of which of these is important for macro. What is the primordial friction? Which of these frictions matter the most for macroeconomic outcomes? And if so, how should we uh, verify that statement? Okay. And perhaps regime shifts is one of the natural candidates. So that's all I had to say. So thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Alex. Start opening the floor for discussion, but maybe I don't know if you want to react to to Alex, or we just start collecting already questions. Um, I think that Alex touched on maybe all the important uh, points of, of the paper. I think that the way that Andre and I think about this paper is maybe, you know, we're trying to open a discussion that um, this expect this this um, uh, forecast error regressions, right, in, re in reduced form, um, they are not universal tests, right, about fire. Uh, but certainly not universal tests about other expectations theories. And what we're trying to sort of show through this paper, maybe a little bit more generally, is that uh, testing for different expectations theories should not be decoupled from the data generating process itself because that can have major implications even for the super basic case of, of FIRE as, as we try to show. And then I totally agree with, with Alex that there's other ways that we can certainly reject fire at the individual level. So as, as Alex um, uh, pointed out, fire cannot uh, whatsoever explain why we have heterogeneity in forecasts. But maybe you know, it's not a bad metaphor for when it comes to average, um, average expectations about inflation and, and output growth that we try to entertain in our uh, macro models. Um, yeah. And Let's see if forward to the questions. questions. Yep. From the audience. Yes. Bartosz. Yes. Uh, Bartosz Maćkowiak, ECB. So, so on your point about, um, uh, on your point that uh, theories of expectation formation ought to be evaluated as part of fully specified models, it would be interesting to uh, compare the fit of your model, the Smets vouters with regime switches uh, in monetary policy and fire to the fit of a, a version of the version of the same model, but without regime switches, but with an information friction. You know, the fit of the model to standard macro data and data on beliefs, expectations. That would be an interesting exercise, I think. Yes, sir. I mean, that's. There's many avenues that, that, um, that this can go forward, and certainly that's, that's one avenue that, that we can entertain comparing the two. Um, eventually, in this application that we have with the, with the DSG model, we cannot, feed, uh, we cannot feed SPF data or any other form of expectational data because we're already disciplining expectations using FIRE, and that's the test that, that we need to run, but it's, um, yeah, I'm sympathetic to, to that suggestion. Hassan Afruzi, Colombia. So I want to touch on one of the issues that Alex uh, brought up, the uh, fact that individual regressions versus uh, regressions over time series, average regressions like Koiban and Gornichenko. Um, this is also a clarifying question in the sense that, am I right that in your model, if you ran the regressions in the cross-section of a bunch of agents, you would not see any deviations from, like, that would be a very clear test of the model mechanism 
uh, with respect to data. Um, so that's the question number one. And then um, in, in so far that we're thinking about these time varying uh, uh, coefficients that you're estimating, once we deviate from a linearized model, there are many reasons that these coefficients should vary, right? Like, um, it could be nonlinearities, my favorite one, rational attention, that like during different periods, people pay, differentially, uh, pay attention differentially to these variables. Is there a way of uh, understanding whether we're going in your direction or in direction of one of these other explanations? Um, yes, yeah, so regarding the first uh, question, right, so certainly, <laughs> Again, looking at individual forecasts, it, you know, it's, an, it's an immediate way to, to reject fire, right? We cannot, even if you take, I don't know, the most sophisticated heterogeneous agents model, right? There is no way that, that um, people are going to, under fire, that people are going to give you two different answers about aggregate variables, right? Because they understand the probability distributions and, and so on and forth. So I totally agree that, um, that um, heterogeneity in individual forecasts, it's one, it is one valid way to, to reject fire. And then regarding the second question, I love that question because I think that uh, the natural answer to that is exactly to run you know, this type of, of tests that are conditional on your data generating process and conditional on, on your favorite expectational uh, theory um, using this, this simulation methods or finite samples. Um, Maybe one, one comment that I would like to add in the, in the, in the waves, right? So, um, of course, one can argue that, that those waves that we showed, right, they might be subject to finite sample biases. We've played around with, with the number of, of quarters. Eventually, the smaller you make the number of quarters, the more severe the finite sample bias uh, is. In earlier versions of the paper, we actually showed bootstrapped uh, I mean, we showed the, those same similar waves while taking um, taking uh, care of the finite sample bias using bootstrapping methods. And um, yeah, the waves were still there. Giorgio has a yeah. question. Oh, sorry. Giorgio Primicelli, Northwestern. So it seems to me that your recommendation and the test that you propose is based uh, on a single uh, DSG model. And so depending on the problem at hand, uh, you might need to adapt that DSG model to test particular channels. Uh, but maybe I'm misunderstanding, but it seems to me that uh, that model doesn't have to be a structural model, a DSG model. It could be a VAR with regime switching or a nonlinear, a nonlinear reduced form model. And I think a reduced form model, first of all, is probably going to fit the data better. And second, is going to be more flexible uh, and might not need to be adapted to any change in the, in the question or in the specific uh, um, expectation theory that you want to test. Uh, so it might be a more flexible device to conduct your, uh, um, your test. Absolutely, I think that that's a great point. So uh, one comment, it is true that we are working with a particular DSG model solved under the assumption of fire, right? However, we're arguing that we are accounting somehow for uncertainty in the DSG model by accounting for the posterior distribution of, of, of the parameters in the DSG model. But in essence, really what you need is a data generating process that is somehow subject to regime shifts. A DSG model, of course, helps you interpret those regime shifts. I don't think that you can say much in a VAR uh, world. And all that you need is that the forecasts right, are consistent fully with the data generating process and the presence of regime shifts. Um, So I'm, I'm not a particular fan of fire, <laughs> but, but this being said, I don't think that the gap between average forecasts and individual forecasts, and in particular the heterogeneity in individual forecasts, is necessarily you know, a, a reason to reject fire, because there's a lot of, I mean, if you think how these surveys get collected, people you know, probably had just their kids brought back from the doctor or something. They get called up at home and ask about the forecast inflation. And, and, and in, in these sort of surveys, uh, 
some collected over the internet, some over the phone. I mean, there's just a lot of response noise. Uh, it's probably the idiosyncratic state in which you just find yourself. And, and a lot of, I suppose, I mean, I don't have a proof, but I mean, I would expect that a lot of the cross-sectional heterogeneity in forecasts is, you know, when did you just catch people to answer that question? And it has just nothing fundamental to it. And that's probably the reason why in the first, you know, why Kobyan and Gorodnichenko started by averaging, because they, they were worried about this forecast response noise, and they tried to get rid of it by averaging. So. I mean, probably there is a way to, to see whether that heterogeneity is really that significant that would alter things. I, I agree with that. But sort of taking the, say, the SPF data as given and just taking those, you know, point forecasts as given and not thinking, you know, too much about the, 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 the situations where these people were, were, were at when they had to give forecasts about, about inflation. Uh, th th that's what we had in mind when that's what we have in mind when we say that maybe that's one way to, to reject fire but I'm happy to maybe talk more about this this argument yeah. Just a quick response to Klaus. I mean I'm sure there's a lot of noise in there but you know if you look at this survey data there's also a pers there's also a lot of persistence in these individual um, heterogeneity so that to me suggests it's not like just noise because you know if someone is more optimistic, they continue to be more optimistic next round. By the way, there's also a lot of heterogeneity when uh, monetary policy committee members forecast. And again, that's quite persistent heterogeneity. And these are, I think, forecasts that are much more seriously done. Still, like, heterogeneity is still there. So it suggests to me it's not uh, all noise, but it was more to <laughs> response to you. Yeah. Thank you. So with that, I uh, close this session. I thank a lot Ina and also Alex for the discussion and presentation.